My name is Henry Wiley, and I'm a staff clinician at the National Eye Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I'm going to talk about the management of retinal hemangioblastoma and other manifestations of ocular von Hippel-Lindau disease. I did not receive compensation for this work and have no relevant disclosures to make regarding any conflicts of interest. The cardinal feature of VHL disease in the eye is the retinal hemangioblastoma, which also goes by other names, including retinal capillary hemangioma, retinal capillary hemangioblastoma, and retinal angioma. It's a benign neoplasm that does not spread beyond the confines of the eye, but poses risk to vision and sometimes to the integrity of the eyeball itself through growth associated with retinal exudation, fibrosis, vitreous and subretinal hemorrhage, or retinal detachment. These tumors are detected by careful ophthalmic evaluation that includes a dilated examination of the retina and optic disc, sometimes supplemented with imaging techniques that I'll show. In a patient not known to have VHL disease, the identification of one or more retinal hemangioblastomas can prompt genetic and medical testing to evaluate for the systemic condition. Recognition of a retinal hemangioblastoma and appropriate referral by an ophthalmologist for further testing can be life-saving because of the potentially life-threatening nature of VHL lesions such as renal cell carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, and central nervous system hemangioblastoma. This color photograph montage of the right fundus belongs to a 20-year-old woman referred to our clinic for evaluation of an exited retinal lesion in the right eye. She had noted blurring of central vision starting around six months prior. She was healthy without any significant medical history. She did not have any family history of kidney cancer, but she reported history of pancreatic cancer in her paternal grandmother and cerebral aneurysms in the father of her paternal grandmother. Her best corrected visual acuity in the right eye tested 2040, compared with 2016 in her left eye. Color photographs like this one have excellent resolution, sometimes an important aid to ophthalmoscopy in these patients, but a limited field of view, requiring many images to survey the fundus. This is a pseudocolor image of the eye, obtained using an ultra-wide field scanning laser ophthalmoscope. In a single frame, it shows most of the retina, with resolution that's sufficient for detection of all but the smallest lesions. The tumor within the retina at the equator inferiorly is between two and three diameters of the optic disc, or around four millimeters in diameter, bulges in nodular fashion into the vitreous cavity, though it remains contained within the layers of the neurosensory retina, and has prototypical features of a large retinal hemangioblastoma, including a red or orange tumor body, very dilated and tortuous feeding and draining blood vessels, a localized area of intraretinal and subretinal fluid around its base, and more remote exudation consisting of edema and lipid deposits affecting the macula, the part of the retina responsible for central vision. A cross-sectional image of the macula obtained using optical coherence tomography shows subretinal fluid and cystic thickening of the central retina responsible for the deficit in central vision. Also shown are the corresponding images for the normal left eye for comparison. A fundoscopic examination of both eyes is sufficient to make the diagnosis of a retinal hemangioblastoma, but ancillary imaging is helpful to document pretreatment lesion features and degree of exudation and to help rule out presence of additional tumors. Fluorescein angiography, which involves intravenous injection of fluorescein and sodium and acquisition of images with appropriate light filters in place, can be useful to highlight retinal hemangioblastomas, which avidly take up dye in the early frames of the angiogram and show prominent late staining and variable leakage in later frames. Our group finds ultra-wide field fluorescein angiography to be very useful for detection of small retinal hemangioblastomas that can be overlooked on ophthalmoscopy or color images and others have published on the sensitivity of tumor detection offered by this technique. Here's an early frame of the fluorescein angiogram of the right eye, showing the expected uptake of dye by the large hemangioblastoma, and no other tumors in visible parts of the fundus. So-called steered views can be used to image as much of the peripheral retina as possible. A corresponding image of the left fundus shows a normal retina without any lesions. It was important in this case to determine whether the tumor was solitary or not. A solitary retinal hemangioblastoma can occur sporadically in the absence of VHL disease, but the presence of more than one tumor in the same patient 
is sufficient to make a clinical diagnosis of VHL disease. Even the presence of a single retinal hemangioblastoma in this patient was concerning for possible underlying VHL disease, particularly given her young age and features of her family history. And we recommended both genetic testing for VHL gene mutations and systemic evaluation, including imaging of her brain, spine, abdomen, and pelvis, plus testing for urine catecholamines. Given the availability of such testing and the potentially life-threatening nature of a missed or delayed diagnosis of VHL disease, our group routinely pursues genetic and systemic testing in all cases of solitary hemangioblastoma, relying on the expertise of radiologists, oncologists, genetic counselors, and other specialists as warranted for interpretation of results. There are other retinal lesions that can simulate retinal hemangioblastoma, including vasoproliferative tumors of the ocular fundus and others, but a full discussion of the differential is beyond the scope of this presentation. All patients with known VHL disease require lifelong surveillance for development of retinal hemangioblastomas, consisting of dilated eye exams, at least annually, and more often as warranted by the circumstances, typically beginning in early childhood. The critical importance of routine surveillance is built on the following. First, new retinal hemangioblastomas can appear throughout life. Second, small tumors are usually readily treated, but do not often cause symptoms to bring them to a patient's attention, so are typically only identified by thorough and timely ophthalmic examination. Third, retinal hemangioblastomas that grow large enough to cause symptoms are often large enough to make treatment less effective and more risky underscoring the value of early detection. Retinal hemangioblastomas start as barely visible red dots similar in size to a retinal microaneurysm or intraretinal hemorrhage. Here's a color fundus photograph of a cluster of five retinal hemangioblastomas at varying stages of early development. The smallest is very difficult to see, and it's not always possible to distinguish a lesion of this size from a hemorrhage or microaneurysm though fluorescein angiography can be helpful for detection and discernment from other lesions. These two slightly larger tumors are both characterized by tiny feeding and draining blood vessels, confirming their nature. And these two largest tumors are still small compared with the large lesions shown in earlier slides and are not yet producing significant exudation, but have well-developed feeding and draining vessels. The growth rate is extremely variable, the fastest growing tumors can show measurable increase in size across a few months, but other more indolent lesions may grow more slowly over years, and we do not have good predictors for which lesions will grow fastest. All of the retinal hemangioblastomas shown so far are designated as extrapapillary tumors. There are also so-called juxtapapillary retinal hemangioblastomas, designated as such because they arise within or at the border of the optic disc present in around 13% of eyes having lesions in a large published cohort, and classified separately because they have a distinct appearance in natural history and require a different approach to treatment. Here's a color photograph and OCT line scan image of a juxtapapillary hemangioblastoma and its associated macular edema. Note the absence of visible feeding and draining vessels and the effacement of the temporal disc rim. These lesions can cause visual impairment even when small in cases where they produce exudation affecting the central macula, as shown here. The goal of treatment for extrapapillary retinal hemangioblastomas is to destroy tumors when they are small and more readily ablated, rendering them incapable of further growth before they threaten central vision. Thermal laser photocoagulation performed in the office, typically under topical anesthesia, is used for ablation of small extrapapillary retinal hemangioblastomas. Published case series have shown that laser applied at one or more sessions is capable of destroying almost all lesions with a diameter of 1.5 millimeters or smaller, with larger lesions more likely to require multiple treatment sessions. Our technique involves confluent application of burns over the entire tumor body, using longer duration and lower power than would be typical for a panretinal photocoagulation spot to achieve maximal penetration of lesion thickness, titrated to an intense gray-white burn. We do not separately target retina around the base of the lesion, but do so to the extent that it's necessary to include the borders of the tumor in the treatment field. We do not treat the feeding arterial, though some do, particularly for larger lesions. 
This intensity of treatment often produces scant intraretinal, preretinal, and or subretinal hemorrhage, but in our experience, vitreous hemorrhage after treatment of small lesions is rare. We typically reassess lesions for possible further treatment in two to four months, but retreatment can be undertaken earlier if necessary. Here's a series of photos showing the appearance of an approximately 0.5 millimeter diameter lesion before, one day after, and three months after treatment. Treated lesions must be monitored for viability and capacity for further growth. A successfully treated lesion may appear as a core retinal scar without any residual tumor body, or as a white or yellow fibrotic nubbin corresponding to the prior tumor. Regressed, still visible, but effectively treated lesions will often still stain with fluorescein, and the only definitive measure of success is long-term documentation of no regrowth. Ablative thermal laser photocoagulation can be attempted for retinal hemiglobinomas with diameters larger than 1.5 millimeters, but multiple sessions are usually necessary, and success rates drop significantly with increasing tumor size and thickness. For these lesions, our group usually employs transscleral cryotherapy using a double freeze thaw technique when it's safe to do so, meaning that the lesion is far enough from the optic disc and macula to safely treat, is not part of a large cluster of tumors and is not accompanied by significant pre-existing preretinal fibrosis or areas of retinal traction for which post-treatment exudation and fibrotic contraction can be problematic. Very peripheral tumors can be treated transconjunctivally in the office, while more posterior lesions require conjunctival incision in the operating room to access the appropriate spot on the eye wall. Cryotherapy of lesions this size commonly causes exudative retinal detachment that is usually localized, but can be extensive enough to involve the macula in some cases. Although there are no studies evaluating the relative merits, our group typically uses a short course of systemic corticosteroids to try to blunt post-treatment exudation in cases where there is no medical contraindication. In an adult, we will usually give prednisone 60 milligrams or equivalent starting at treatment then, once daily, tapered to off within four to seven days. We do not find corticosteroids useful for resorption of subretinal fluid once present, so do not extend treatment beyond a week. Here's a montage photograph of two tumors, super temporally, with diameter larger than 1.5 millimeter, and two small tumors inferiorly. Double freeze thaw cryotherapy was applied to the two large lesions, and indirect laser photocoagulation was applied to the small lesions in the operating room with intravenous methylprednisolone given at surgery. Here's an image of the fundus the day afterward, showing post-treatment effects on the tumors and presence of a peripheral exudative retinal detachment that resolved over the weeks that followed. Here's an image three years later. Note that the superior tumor shows regression, but the presence of some lipid exudation posterior to it that was not visible at earlier post-treatment exams. While the other three lesions still appear adequately treated, further intervention should be considered for the superior tumor. Juxtapapillary retinal hemangioblastomas and large extrapapillary tumors are difficult to manage. Here are images of advanced ocular VHL disease and the associated visual acuity for each eye. Ablative radiation or surgical excision can be performed for some extrapapillary tumors but carry high risks and often limited success in the setting of progressive disease. Juxtapapillary lesions are not usually safe to destroy because of potential damage to the optic disc and parts of the retina serving central vision. And non-ablative treatments like injection of anti-BEGF drugs or use of photodynamic therapy with vertiporphin infusion have not proven very effective at control in most cases. A detailed discussion of management of complicated cases is beyond the scope of this presentation, but the limitations to treatment at this stage underscore the importance of trying to identify and destroy extrapapillary retinal hemangioblastomas when they are small, whenever possible. As mentioned previously, the need for surveillance is lifelong, and we have patients who have undergone multiple laser ablative sessions over many years with outcomes that can be very gratifying with early detection and timely treatment. Many appropriately managed eyes can retain normal, or near normal vision. Other manifestations of ocular VHL disease include retinal vascular proliferation and retrobulbar optic nerve hemangioblastoma. 
Retinovascular proliferation can appear as a lacy network of blood vessels growing epiretinally, often at the posterior pole, with a variable fibrotic and contractile component, or as a small saccular lesion that can be difficult to distinguish from a retinal hemangioblastoma. It's important to note that the natural history is distinct from that of neovascularization and the sending of ischemic retinal disease, such as diabetic retinopathy, and it's often possible to observe these areas or to remove them at surgery if the contractile effects lead to reduction in vision. Central nervous system hemangioblastomas occurring posterior to the eyeball in the orbit are rare, but should be considered along with other extraocular lesions in cases where vision loss in a patient with VHL disease cannot be explained by intraocular pathology. VHL disease is relatively rare, and most ophthalmologists will seldom encounter retinal hemangioblastomas. If unsure about how to proceed with potential diagnosis and treatment of retinal hemangioblastomas and ocular VHL disease, it's important to refer patients to a retina specialist familiar with management of these lesions. This concludes this overview on management of retinal hemangioblastoma and ocular VHL disease. Thanks very much for watching.